Well, good morning, everyone. How are y'all doing? Yeehaw. Yeah. Trey's doing good. Hey, if this is your first time to Light Church, I want to welcome you. And if it's not, man, I want to thank you for coming back. So uh, we are in week number two of our Going Deep series. All right. Y'all enjoying it so far after one sample? Yep. Okay, cool. We'll try harder today. All right. Hey, today we're going to be, disco- uh, we're going to be discovering about deception. And, and the title of this message is Looks Can Be Deceiving. Um, so if, you, if this is your first time and you, you're not tracking, uh, this series is based off the premise of John 7, 24, where Jesus tells uh, us, hey, we have to look beneath the surface so we can judge correctly, right? That presumes that what you see with your eyes isn't always what's the reality. We got a fun exercise this morning. Anybody uh, remember the dress that broke the internet years ago? Oh, yeah. Okay. And before we get started, nobody get upset at each other. Some people see different things, but there really is only two options. This dress that we're going to show here in just a second is either white and gold or it's blue and black. That's the only two options. You see one or the other, okay? So I'm going to take a survey real quick. If you see that dress as white and gold, raise your hand. I mean, that's like the whole church. See that? Hey, we beat the odds. Cody, you disagree? Okay, raise your hand if it's blue and black. Okay. Hey, this is a real thing, guys. Like, this, this, this divided America and the world, like, years ago. Um, okay, so y'all want to know the, the real answer? The dress is blue and black. Two-thirds of America voted that this is white and gold. I can only see white and gold. No matter, Laren sees blue and black. We took a survey. You see white this time. You need to make your mind up, man. Like, I'm, I'm doing this right now. Like, are you blue and black or white and gold? So, anyways, all that to say, two-thirds of America saw white and gold. And why is that? If the dress is blue and black, why do we see white and gold? Well, it's our eyes deceived us, man. It's the way it was presented to us. This dress is blue and black. Not in this picture, but, the, like, there's a neuroscientist that explained it this way. Our brains automatically fill in gaps when we have partial information that's called assumptive behavior we make assumptions with what we see we go ahead and fill it in some some weird way that the light hit this dress and it was photographed and what Stephen would call poor lighting I just call it white and gold lighting um, it makes it to where our brains say oh that's white and gold it can't be blue and black we don't see enough some of y'all are gifted I guess Ashley and Larry you were but I mean, Cody, Cody, Cody's still gifted. <laughs> Anyways, th- this, this, this little exercise, I really wanted y'all to see this because um, when we see white and gold, man, you believe that that's white and gold, right? You believe what you see based off of the information that you have. Therefore, we have to look beneath the surface to see what things really are, okay? What we see isn't always true. So, church, I want us this morning, this is the big takeaway, I want us to quit making assumptions when we have partial information, okay? And that can be what God's doing. We make assumptions on what he's doing based off of partial information. We make assumptions on each other based off of partial information, right? And that right there short stops the truth, man. It really does. Okay, so... Um, looks can be deceiving. Wow, man, that's incredible. Hey, give the hand to Stephen, man. That's, Im- that's improvement right there. Okay. So, um, deceive in its verb tense means to believe something that is not true, typically in order to gain some personal advantage. Okay. Or uh, give a mistaken impression. Or, and this is the one that's going to really, really apply for us today, fail to admit to oneself that something is true. Okay, so Billy Graham says it this way. There are two ingredients to deceit, a good bit of truth and a few little lies. Uh, Some ancient dude named Demosthenes explained it this way. Uh, The easiest thing of all is to deceive oneself for what a man wishes he generally believes to be true. So Jeremiah in uh, 17, uh, chapter 17, verse 9 says, The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who knows how bad it is? So the enemy doesn't always have to deceive us directly like he did in the garden. 
we're often very good at deceiving ourselves based off of our own desires and what we want to be true. But one day, we will all have to face the truth. And I'm saying the capital truth, not capital T truth. One day we'll all face him. So that's going to take us to our main passage today. And if you've got your Bibles, and I hope you do, open them up to Matthew chapter 7. It's on the YouVersion app for you digital crew. And we'll talk about distraction next week. Um, and we're going to start in verse 21. And we're going to follow it all the way through 23. And this is Jesus. This is in red letters talking about the end times. And he says, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who breaks God's laws. Okay, that should give you a little bit of chills, right? It gives me chills because uh, I'm a pastor of this church, man. And these dudes thought they were doing everything right. They came to Bible studies. They amen at every worship song. They wore a cross necklace. Uh, they haven't missed church in 78 years. Um, they read their Bibles through and through and all that other good stuff. Um, they even tell others about Jesus. But what was the main ingredient that was missing there? A personal relationship. Depart from me. I never knew you. If the Bible is true and it says that Jesus hears our prayers and he's close to the broken heart, then he's close to all of us, and he hears us all the time, right? So what was the problem there? They're missing a personal relationship with Jesus. Church, I'm about to hurt some feelings. 63% of Americans say that they're Christians. 4% say they follow Jesus. How on earth can you be a Christian, a little Christ, a little Messiah, a little Jesus, but you don't follow him? The conclusion that I came to, man, is that we're deceived. We're deceived on what a Christian really is. We're deceived that you can be a Christian, that you can have a passage into heaven, that you can have this hope, but you don't have a relationship with the dude that gave it to you. How on earth can we sit here today in church, holy, right? We, we're singing, we're raising our hands, we're doing great stuff. Isaac's beating the brakes off the drums. By the way, great job. Man, it, it really is. It really is. Hey, man, it makes it a lot easier to do this when I don't got to do that too. So anyways, um, the emphasis is too much on Christian and what we label ourselves and we identify ourselves, not what we are becoming, right? A Christian isn't something that you are. It's something you become. It takes a lifelong process of sanctification to become like Christ, right? Anybody in here exactly like Christ right now? Okay. As I say, thank you for not going me, you know. The word disciple or apprentice or follower is used 269 times in the New Testament. 269 times. The word Christian, three. And it was used as a slur or slang, derogatory term to make fun of those that followed the way. Later we embraced it and we call it cool and we call ourselves Christians, right? The majority of America does. But the majority of America doesn't know that they have to follow Jesus to be a Christian. So somewhere along the line, we got off track. And this is super important to me because I care more about you being a follower of Jesus than calling yourself a Christian. As your pastor, dude, it haunts me to think that one day you may go to heaven and I don't want Jesus to go, hey, depart from me. I never knew you. All right? I know this is a heavy message. I told y'all last week, but that's okay. So these people in Matthew 7 were doing all the right things. Uh, it's just one ingredient, the personal uh, relationship uh, missing. Um, they thought that they could do the works of Jesus without believing in Jesus themselves. Now, that didn't go so hot for another uh, uh, set of fellows that tried to cast out some demons, and the demon beat them naked and ran them off and all that good stuff. It's fun. The Bible's super fun. Y'all should read it sometime. But one way or another... Um, uh, J Pope John Paul II says that the greatest deception and the deepest source of unhappiness is the illusion of finding life by excluding God, of finding freedom by excluding moral truths and personal responsibility. You're not going to be happy if you haven't got God. You want to know the secret of life? There it is right there. Can't do it without God. If you try to do it without God, congratulations. I don't know how long that'll last, but you'll be disappointed. 
you'll be discouraged, all that kind of good stuff. So, so I don't get this. Jesus says you'll be able to go out and cast demons, right? You'll be able to go out and heal my name. You'll be able to go out and do these things, right? But if that's not, if they did it and that didn't work out, that, that wasn't good enough, then what does he really want from us? What does he really want? In order to find this, man, you got to go to John chapter 6. The answer's right there. So we'll go in verse, we'll start in 28. I probably didn't give you that, Stephen, but we'll hit 28, and then I'll go into 29 because the answer is there. So they replied, we want to perform God's works too. What should we do? We want to do that. I want to do God's works. What can I do today to do that? Instead of, hey, just let God do God's works, right? Let, eventually, when you're a Christian, you're sanctified, you'll start doing God's works as a byproduct of just following him, of just believing in the one he sent, which is exactly what he answers. Jesus told them in verse 29, John chapter 6, verse 29, this is the only, say only, okay, this is the only work God wants from you. Wants from me? Yes. Wants from you? Yes. Believe in the one he has sent. And who is that? Are you kidding me? Is that simple? That's, that's the only work he wants from me is just to believe in Jesus. The answer, church, is yes. That's it. Why? One, really, that's all we can handle. And we barely handle that. Again, we've deceived ourselves thousands of years later into thinking we're Christians and we only follow Jesus. We only pay attention to what his teachings are. We don't live for him. We don't die daily on a cross for him. We, don't tell, we sure don't tell others about him. See all the empty seats? How many conversations did we have this week about Jesus? That he saved our life. That he died for us in our place. Church, this, this isn't unique. You go to every other church in, in, in the county. It, it looks just like this. Maybe worse. I can go and evangelize, tell them blue in the face. You guys reach far more people in your influence, in your neck of the woods, in your professions, in your families than I ever can alone. Okay? You have to tell people about what he's done. Right? Believe in him. If you truly believe in him, you won't be able to stop talking about him. Paul gets this, Peter gets this, John gets this. They go to court about it, all kinds of stuff. Justin and Epps and I, back, hey, P.S., update, official retirement date from the U.S. Army today. I'm done. It's over. It's finished after a two and a half year uh, exodus out of that and all that kind of good stuff. It is finally finished and God was faithful to see it to the end. So guess what? Now I can no longer get in trouble for putting scripture on federal government documents and things like that. So anyways. I'm, that's the kind of guy you're, you're listening to. Okay, so that's it. It's so simple, it's hard. Just believe in the one he has sent. It raises so many questions, though, that over time we just shift following Jesus into some religious hamster wheel of work that loses its focus. Okay, listen. One thing that drives unbelievers nuts, if you're trying to witness to people, is a church that's in a vegetable state full of religious nuts with no spiritual fruit. I'll say that one more time. Because this is also what drives Jesus nuts in the Bible, is a church in a vegetable state full of religious nuts with no, no spiritual fruit, man. Where does spiritual fruit come from? Holy Spirit, right? Dwells within us. When? When we believe in the one that's sent. See how this all ties together? You want to get moving? You want to change people's lives? You want to go deeper in your faith with Jesus, which is what this series is about? That's, matter of fact, that's what the whole thing's about. Like, if you're new today and you're wondering like what this church is about, this whole thing's just set up for you to encounter God. Surprise. Kids' church, it's a set up. Worship, it's a set up. The invite that you got here today from whoever that you drug you here, it's a set up. The whole thing's a set up for you to encounter God. Spoiler alert. Next week, same thing. Week after, it'll be the same thing. So please come back. This whole thing's a set up. Okay. So like I said, being a Christian is a natural or supernatural transformative byproduct of following Jesus. Okay, you are becoming like Jesus. Every one of us, if you have accepted him, you are becoming like him. You are taking these steps. And in order to do that, you got to do some of these disciplines that he did, right? Die to self, all that stuff. But the only work that is asked of you by the Father is to believe in the one he has sent. Okay? So let's go further down. So we were just in John 29, uh, 6, 29. Let's go into John uh, 38 through 40. That's got some pretty solid nuggets. It's going to 
kind of complete this deal, right? So Jesus says, for I have come down from heaven. Where did he come down from? Okay, cool, y'all listen. To do the will of God who sent me, not to do my own will, right? If we're to become like Jesus, then we are not to do our own will. We're to do whose will? Bam, we're, we're paying attention. We're getting it now. And this is the will of God for Jesus, that I shall not lose even one of all those he has given me. That's every one of us that he shouldn't lose us, but that I should raise them up on the last day, or at the last day. Justin and I will be preaching through a series of the resurrections after we conclude this one, so hang tight. For it is my Father's will that all who see his Son and believe in him should have eternal life. I will raise them up at the last day. And that's good news. Like, does that not get you, like, somewhat excited? How many of y'all got some really, like, I got to talk into, so how many of y'all got some, like, terrible bills um, this week. Yeah. Us too, bro. Um, anybody get a phone call from a doctor you're not the biggest fan of? Anybody lose a loved one? Anybody take a tough case at work? Anybody hoping it's not going to be like this forever? Good news for you and I that believe in the one he sent, it won't be. It's going to be heaven. It's going to be awesome. No more tears. No more pain. No more bills in the mail. No more phone calls asking for more money. None of that stuff, right? And that sounds incredible. Like, it absolutely sounds incredible. But for a second, man, we can't think that Jesus doesn't know how hard it is for us to do the, the will of the Father. You want to know how hard it was for him to do the will of the Father? Listen to his prayer in Luke chapter 22, verse 42. You get that one for me? So this is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knows what's coming. Jesus knows what's coming. And for all y'all that are new... He's going to the cross to die for our sins, not his own, because he was sinless. He's going to die for ours. He's going to pay for ours to bring us back into right standing with the Father, which is the Father's will, P.S. Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. In other words, God, if we can do this some other way, like if they'll just believe in me, is that good enough? Partially, yeah, that, that's good enough on their half. But you, my son, you got to go to that cross, Bubba. That's the only way. That's the only way it's going to work for them. They're deceived. Since the garden, they live in this constant state of deception. Church religion has screwed up the relationship. It's the only work he wants from you is to just believe in him. It's not faith plus all this other crazy stuff. Faith, faith plus circumcision, faith plus works, faith plus, faith plus. Faith. It's faith in him alone because it was through him alone that you and I are saved, right? Okay. So the Father's will for Jesus was for him to come down from heaven, live a perfect sinless life to atone for our sins, to provide a stop to the damage caused by the deception in the Garden of Eden. Jesus was betrayed mocked, slandered, spit upon, whipped, beat black and blue, and crowned with thorns, hung on a cross for all to see. The Father's will for us, that was the Father's will for him. The Father's will for us, to believe in him. That's it. It's that simple. Does everyone understand what the Father's will for you is? Okay. Uh, then a win. We can call it good. But it doesn't seem fair, does it? The absolute least we can do is acknowledge that we have a problem, a disease of the soul. And this man, this God, loves us so much, he went through all this to repair our souls, no longer slaves to sin and deception, but followers of the way, the truth, and the life. If you want a personal relationship, Stephen, you probably come on up, Bubba. If you want a personal relationship with this Jesus, uh, the Bible tells us in Romans 10, starting in verse 9, I'm going to read through 13 because I like it. Is that good with y'all? Can I read it because I like it? Yeah. All right. Starting at verse 9, excuse me. It says, if you openly declare that Jesus is the Lord, which means you do what he says, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart, that deceptively wicked thing, that's so why you don't follow your heart, you follow Jesus, that you are made right with God. 
And it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Today, I'm going to give you an opportunity to openly declare your faith just in case for some reason or another you got duped into being a Christian and never once had a relationship with Jesus. We're going to give you an opportunity to make that right. As the scriptures tell us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you don't know anything else, that is the greatest thing that you could know right there. All you got to do is call on him. It's what the thief on the cross did. Man, you really are the son of God. Yep, I am. Matter of fact, today you'll join me in heaven. Because the only work that he wants from us is to believe in the one he sent. I'm going to pray for us real quick. I say real quick, it probably won't. I'll probably drag it on. Stephen's going to lead us in a moment of worship. I'm going to ask you, man, as you just close your eyes and you think and you reflect over this message just to believe in the one that he sent. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me through this message? Do I have a right standing relationship with you? Jesus, maybe we don't talk as much as we should, and I'm sorry for that. But I'm here today in your house with your people listening to your word. And I want to make that right. Jesus, I believe in you, that you are the son of God. Jesus, I want to do it your way. I want to follow you. I don't want to follow my heart any longer. My heart has gotten me to to the place where I'm at in life. But Jesus, I know that you can give me eternal life, that you can take me into a new life, that you can do that today by transformation and the work of your Holy Spirit, that you can save me, that you want to, and that's your Father's will. If you've never accepted Jesus in your life and you want to do that, Justin Epps is up here. I'm up here. There's a lot of folks, man, you can grab a hold of, even your neighbor if you're scared. If you're scared with a you, grab your neighbor. Walk through that passage there in Romans chapter 10. And just allow that Holy Spirit to talk to you. Just talk to him. 